I'm the project officer for Connecting Small Histories and we're thrilled obviously to have you all here this evening to celebrate the launch of Heritage Detectives, a cross-curriculum local history and activity book for Key Stage 2. So I'd just like to start by saying a huge thank you to everyone that made this evening and this book possible. Firstly, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who have so generously supported this project, and also to the Jewish Chronicle, who have partnered with the project and JSCM um, to share more about this event with people. And our project team, Ed, Sarah, Trish, Zoe and Carter, and of course the volunteers, Anne, who is with us this evening, um, Hilary, Lisa, Bella, Jane and Rachel, and of course the designers at Big Gun Graphics who have done such a great job at bringing this booklet and our characters to life. And we'd also just like to thank everybody who's on the programme this evening and you'll be introduced to those as we go along. Just a bit of housekeeping before we hand over to Ed to kick this evening off. This evening is scheduled to run until 8pm and that includes some time at the end for discussion and any questions that you may have. Everyone should now be on mute and we encourage you to stay on mute throughout so as not to distract the speakers. Um, you can use the chat box though, and we'd encourage you to do so. Jot down any comments or questions and we can come back to those through the course of the evening once we get to the Q&A. During the Q&A, you may also be asked to unmute and share with us uh, on screen. I nearly said in person, but sadly still not to be. Finally, we are looking forward to sharing with you an evening of entertainment and highlights from the Heritage Detectives book and the additional resources. At the end of the evening, we're going to share the website address with you where it can all be freely downloaded. And this will also be sent out in an email at the end of the week so that you'll have it as a, a reference point too. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ed Horridge, Director of the Jewish Small Communities Network and Project Leader, who is going to introduce us to JSCN and talk a bit about how this whole thing came to be. Thanks, Ed. Uh, so I want to just start off um, by telling you a little bit about Jewish Small Communities Network, why this project has come about and, and a few of our ideas about the project and, and, and show you a little bit of an insight into some of the communities around the country. So Jewish Small Communities Network is a small charity but reaches out over the whole country. Um, we serve uh, around 55,000 people um, who are in or proximate to 100 small Jewish communities across the whole of the UK. That's a, about 20% of the total UK Jewish population. And those people, uh, where they are members of communities, as are focused around about 72 towns across the UK. Um, we support uh, the leadership, we support resilience within the leadership, um, whether those communities need to uh, deal with a, a changing demographic, so that they need to either expand or they need to deal with different age groups, whether they want to just maintain themselves as they are, or whether they need to actually uh, plan for uh, a managed rundown until that community eventually vanishes. But what we want to do is make sure that all Jewish people in those small communities are able to re live as rich and full a Jewish life as possible. But JSCN is an open door. We deal across the whole of the Jewish spectrum, but not only that, we also deal with inquiry and support for those people who need to know more about Jewish life or Judaism. So where people uh, are interested in the religion, uh, whether they're interested in the way of Jewish life, or whether it's organizations who reach, want to reach in, like the police, the NHS, uh, or whether they would like us to support them and be on their uh, equality boards and um, uh, consultation panels and things like that. In planning this project, um, what we wanted to do was to try and find a way of bringing more awareness about those small Jewish communities. And in fact, the whole footprint of Jewish life, which covers the whole of the country, um, according to the 2011 census, we don't have details of the latest one yet, um, but according to 2011 census, there is somebody who identifies as Jewish in virtually every borough in the whole of the country. And that goes not just in England, but uh, in the devolved 
uh, Wales, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. So uh, Jewish life has impacted the wider community and Jews do tend to get involved, as you'll hear from some of the stories that you can read on our website and the research that we've done. Um, trying to map that footprint was my desire. And I think we've started to achieve that through this project, Connecting Small Histories. And as part of the project, um, we wanted to uh, go out and talk about the heritage, Jewish heritage locally, where it was in our six uh, nominated locations. And Tony's going to tell us rather more about that in, in just after the film. But um, what we wanted to make sure that we did was take a world view of representing Jewish life. In this country, it's predominantly uh, comes from uh, an Ashkenazi Northern European background, it tends to be Poland, the Ukraine, Lithuania, Germany, Austria, places like that. Um, but we have a significant diversity within Judaism and our characters in the uh, heritage detective books um, represent uh, as far as we can that the, the um, Jews are a diverse people uh, and uh, you'll see that as as you get to understand and learn about our uh, book tonight so uh, without more ado uh, I'd like to give you that little insight with a short video about our small communities around the country, and then Tony will take over. So I'm just going to share a bit now about our project and about Heritage Detectives. It's one of the important outcomes from the Jewish Heritage Project Connecting Small Histories. So let me tell you a little bit more. The Connecting Small Histories Project is a partnership between JSCN and Swansea University, and it's generously supported by the Lottery Heritage Fund. Since April 2020, the project team has worked together with a group of highly committed volunteers to help record and capture the proud heritage 
of Jewish social and economic contributions to their towns and connect them to the wider history of Britain. Research and interviews have highlighted a rich tapestry of Jewish heritage in six locations. We've got St Anne's and Eastbourne, which are our coastal locations, Somerset and Cumbria, our rural locations, Bradford and Sunderland, where Jewish communities have recently dispersed. Overall, the project has linked these histories together um, and to each other, pre -exist as well as to pre-existing heritage projects and larger narratives of Jewish history in Britain. We've covered themes of life, creativity, diaspora and future heritage. These fascinating stories have been researched and shared with wider audiences as part of a series of talks to external organisations from NHS chaplaincies to the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain, from Standing Advisory Council on Religious Education Groups known as SACRES to the JW3, a Jewish community centre in London. In March, we hosted a 10 day history festival. This was recorded and the videos are now available online on our Heritage Hub. The hub also includes short articles and interactive Google Maps for each of our target locations. Our most recent outcomes are a Connecting Small Histories project book, which will be available to download for free too from our website in due course. And of course, there is our book for schools, the reason we're all here this evening. Heritage Detectives has been curated to encourage Key Stage 2 pupils to link broader themes of general heritage and diversity to their own locations and experiences. This book has been professionally designed and includes short case studies and snippets inspired by the research of our volunteers to their own locations and, um, sorry, throughout the Connecting Small Histories project. Retired teacher and Girl Guide leader Sally Strauss, who's with us here this evening, says about the book, this excellent workbook uses examples of Jewish heritage to encourage pupils to explore their own heritage. It inspires them to not only look around their local area, but to think about the importance of community more generally and learn more about their own family backgrounds in all of their diversity. So thanks to the support from the Lottery Fund, the entire book is going to be available to download from our Heritage Hub and it can be used by schools across the UK. In addition, we've created an educator guidance page where teachers, homeschoolers, children's group leaders and others can find additional resources to help further unpack the fascinating themes that can be found in Heritage Detectives. Included are useful web addresses, a glossary of key terms, student activities and videos. There are a series of five videos on the page, each offering a different case study of Jewish heritage to support wider investigations of diverse history and heritage by your very own heritage detectives. So let's take a look now at the video on Jewish diversity. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> The Jewish people come from the ancient land of Israel. In fact, the word Jewish is derived from one of the regions of ancient Israel, the region of Judea. The Jewish people lived under their own kings and laws in Israel for around 2,000 years until they were conquered and ruled by foreign kings and emperors and eventually forced to scatter to countries far and wide. Jews probably first came to Britain with the Romans and have been part of the British population on and off ever since. But Jews from different parts of the world have their own special customs and traditional dress. These days the ancestors of the majority of Jews in Britain come from Northern and Eastern Europe, known as Ashkenazi Jews. But prior to the 20th century, the majority in Britain had roots in Spain they were known as Sephardi Jews. Here is the current Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Great Britain. And here is the Sephardi chief rabbi in Israel, together with Israel's Ashkenazi chief rabbi. Jews in Britain blend into the cosmopolitan melting pot here and just look like everyone else. 
back in the middle of the 20th century, Polish Jews similarly looked much like other Poles. This goes on today. Here are modern day Jews in the Ukraine. And here we see Jamaican Jews in the Caribbean. The traditional dress of Moroccan Jews looks amazing and is still worn at weddings and on special occasions today. The Jews of Ethiopia lived in isolation for thousands of years but are now a distinctive part of Israel's population and Jews have lived in Iran for thousands of years and still do today. Sadly, Jewish life in Yemen has recently ended, again after thousands of years, but its colorful traditions continue in the countries that Yemenites have moved to. Jews in modern day Israel are now a melting pot. They share one ethnic root, that of ancient Israel, but with many additional customs blending them all into contemporary life. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next up, we're going to hear from our very own volunteer, Anne Goldstein. Anne has been researching the history and heritage of Eastbourne, and she's going to do a show and tell this evening about her own family, using the activities from the section in Heritage Detectives on diversity. Take it away, Anne. Thank you. That was, that was a beautiful video, by the way. And uh, yeah, I brought my magnifying glass to fit in with the detective's theme. So it's, it's been a pleasure to be involved with the Connecting Small Histories project. And, and I suppose to a small extent to, um, uh, with the Heritage uh, Detectives book, which um, it's, a, it's a colourful booklet that's brimming over with um, amazing ideas for children about how to explore your heritage. So um, I thought that I would share some of the ideas in the book uh, with you by connecting it with my own uh, family history. Uh, and I thought I would do a little tribute to my grandparents actually. And uh, I'll start off with a tribute to um, my grandfather on my mother's side, David Silver and he was born October 1898, and he was an East End of London tailor. Oh, sorry. And uh, here he is with some of his, the people he worked with in his tailoring workshop. Uh, and uh, part of our stories um, from our history uh, include quite sad ones and I remember my grandmother saying that she knew when my when her husband was out of work when grandpa David was out of work because he used to come home carrying his scissors uh, because uh, the tailoring trade well it was it was up and down with lots of periods of, of unemployment uh, also another thing about scissors was that he was uh, he was left-handed, but he was known as an ambidextrous uh, tailor because at school he'd been forced to uh, write with his left hand tied behind him, and so he could cut. He could cut with both hands, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, I also know that he was a very good tailor, and here's a picture of my mum, Rini, uh, wearing one of his outfits. And this, this hat and uh, coat ensemble was made from what, was, what the tailors called cabbage, uh, which, which was um, 
rather illicitly. It was it was made from remnants of cloth that the boss maybe wasn't that aware of, <laughs> and of course, being a, a, a from the from the Jewish community at the time, uh, her grandmother tied a, a red a, a little red thread inside the coat to protect her from the evil eye. Uh, now, one of the aspects in the book uh, is family heritage, and one of the suggestions is find an old photo of your family and look at the photo and um, what questions could you ask about the photo. So I did that with some photos that I happen to have in my mum's, my late mum Rini's album. Uh, and this is my grandfather on the left. So this is Grandpa David, uh, looking to all extents and purposes uh, like a cowboy. <laughs> And uh, sorry, by the way, sorry about the cigarettes. I think it was it was pretty cool at the time to have a cigarette in your mouth. Uh, this is um, Ike and Esther. These are his brother. That's his brother, one of his brothers and sisters. Uh, and uh, I love the horse, which looks really startled. Uh, this is my my grandpa David as a clown. And here he is on a cruise. And of course, he never went on a cruise. I only ever knew him um, going up and down Whitechapel High Street <laughs> on the way to Whitechapel Art Gallery. So um, what, what, what is the story with these pictures? Well, they all came from the fancy dress studios in Oxford Street. I know that because there was a clue on the back of the pictures. And that was really popular in the 1920s to have your photograph um, uh, taken all dressed up in, in, in fancy dress, particularly um, as cowboys. Uh, and when I looked on the internet, when I did some research on it, uh, a lot of other people were doing the same thing in the 1920s. Yes, they were dressing up as, as cowboys and Native Americans. Uh, why is that? Well, I suppose one reason was that it was the golden age of, cine of, of the silent films and uh, people were really getting excited by the movies and they wanted to emulate their heroes. And it was the 1920s, so it was after World War I and uh, people wanted a bit of fun in their life. So uh, I thought you'd be amused by these pictures. Uh, I, there is also um, a mystery um, around my grandfather about where did he live and um, the mystery was part solved when I found on my mother, late mother's key ring a tag which was from uh, my grandfather D. Silver and it actually says on it 22 Felbrigg Street, Cambridge Row, E1 uh, near Bethnal Green and uh, this connected up with a story that I'd heard that he never actually lived at home uh, because there were 10 children in the house and he lived down the street with other people. And this was confirmed by cousin Elliot, who you'll see soon playing the hurdy-gurdy, uh, who found uh, in the census that the family actually lived at 18 Felbrigg Street and uh, David lived at number 22. Uh, I'd also like to pay tribute to my grandma Annie on my dad's side uh, and this is a little clip from the Jewish Chronicle which is a great resource um, and uh, here it says very sadly that she died on June the 23rd 1944 uh, by uh, enemy action. Well what, what's the story with Annie who I am? named after. Uh, well, uh, a bomb fell on her house and uh, she was very tragically killed. Uh, but my cousin, my, but my uncle Tony, uh, who was a baby then, uh, was saved. And there is a family story that um, Annie very bravely threw herself over the cot to save baby Tony's life. And uh, my father, Ivor, uh, was buried under the rubble. And he, he was uh, such an amazing person because he never held a grudge. He was never bitter 
for what happened to him, although he spent the rest of the war, I think, in hospital. And he used to teach me some of the songs he sang in hospital when I was a little girl. And uh, here's baby Tony now, uh, and he lives in Florida. Uh, so uh, also I found out that um, initially I used to assume that my grandma Annie died um, during the Blitz, but that of course wasn't true. Um, she was very sadly killed by a V1 flying bomb, which people called doodle bugs or buzz bombs. There were lots of nicknames for them. Uh, and the Nazis called them the wonder weapons uh, that they thought would turn the tide of, war, of the war. And it was a response to the D-Day um, uh, Allied troops invading uh, German-occupied France. Uh, so Annie actually died uh, ten years, ten, sorry, ten days after uh, the first flying bomb fell in Grove Road, um, Bethnal Green. Uh, Grove Road is now Mile End Park. Uh, there's another story, uh, there's another idea for uh, work in heritage detectives and that's about think about a time when someone from a different community uh, to you has been helped by you and what you learnt from the experience and my thoughts immediately turned to uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about which is my Karnofsky family uh, and uh, this story begins with the Armstrong family and you'll recognize a very young Louis Armstrong on the left so the Armstrong family of New Orleans. And uh, there is, of course, uh, my family, the Karnofsky family, uh, who came from uh, Kovno in Lithuania. And uh, to cut a long story short, they employed a very young Louis Armstrong uh, and looked after him, fed him. Uh, he, he played a bugle on their on their van which was um, uh, delivering coal and uh, Michael one of the Karnofsky boys uh, bought him his first cornet he saw it in a in a pawn shop and bought him his first cornet and, and as they say the rest is history uh, so there's a cornet in the Louis Armstrong Museum and uh, there's Louis wearing a Star of David as a thank you to my Karnofsky family. So um, I thought that was a nice way to finish uh, with an inspiring story, family story about diversity. And uh, the last message I'd like to say to you is there's always more to explore about your family. There's always more to learn. So just enjoy the privilege of exploring your heritage. Thank you. Wow, that's so great, Anne. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really fascinating to see the full spectrum of stories. And I had a note here to mention the keepsake with personal meaning and the story connected to wider and um, historical events that everybody knows, like the Blitz. But Louis Armstrong, wow, you can't get much better than that. <laughs> We think it's really important, this project, our team, JSCN, think it's so important for children to understand that all stories have significance and that richness is found in variety. We're going to head into our music and poetry part of the evening now, just before hearing from our keynote speaker afterwards. So first, we'll hear from Elliot Sinclair, who was interviewed earlier this week by Anne. Elliot is an editor and content creator at the British Library, and he has an interesting story to tell. He was kind enough to share a short performance of himself playing the hurdy-gurdy, and uh, we're going to hear from them, hear from that now. Thank you. Hi, Elliot. Hi. It's Hi. good to see you. Thank you. And uh, it, it's it's something that we've been thinking about, you know, um, from our book, Clear Diverse Heritage. And, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your diverse heritage. Yeah, so I come from both sides of the world, really. Um, um, my mum is Iraqi and she um, she moved from Baghdad in the 70s, in 1973. Um, 
a lot of Jewish people were moving from about the 50s uh, onwards. And I think today there's about um, four Jewish people left in, in Baghdad. Um, and I, it would be my dream to, to visit there one day. Um, I think this uh, my mum's school building is still there somewhere. Um, I'm on a Facebook group now, so I kind of keep up to date with what's what's happening there. Um, I think there's a slight resurrection of the Jewish community in the north, in uh, Kurdistan. Um, yeah, I'd love to visit there one day. And my dad is, um, well, dad's English, and his um, great-grandparents were from Poland on the one side and Romania on the other side. Uh, so I've been doing a bit of digging into the genealogy during lockdown, trying to trace some of my uh, relatives and lost ancestors, and that's how I, that's how I, we, we uh, rekindled our uh, no, relationship. That's it. And uh, why, why do you think it's important, just, just to say briefly, why do you think it's important to look at your family history and explore your heritage? Why do you think that's important? Um, well, there's there's so many stories involved. Um, I think just just like just 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 seeing family and cousins is, is great. But I don't know. There's such a richness in knowing the history behind them and and uh, where people come from. I sometimes look at old black and white photographs, and they're just people, and they just there's a there's a real boundary between where we are and where they are, and it feels like a completely different world. And I I, I really love to dig into it and just put colour into the photos and uh, try and find the stories, find the um, little anecdotes of, of what made them people. And just, um, yeah, tracing it back is just like kind of unlocking your door. And um, I think I spend more time <laughs> like looking for hidden things than I do in the real world. That's a bit of a, my escapist nature. But yeah, I think it's really great to, to delve deep. And you've and you've brought something with you to show. Can, can you oh, talk this about thing, yeah. what? Yeah, tell us yeah. what that is. This is a, a hurdy gurdy. Um, it's a, a medieval instrument, and um, it was used kind of all around Europe. Um, um, yeah, from the like eleven hundreds, and um, yeah, it's kind of got a revival now. Well, I mean, it, it had a kind of bad uh, bad reputation because. Um, it was used by kind of street uh, street beggars, like in the kind of the 1600s, and, and they were kind of blind, so they were just playing very out of tune. And I think that's why it's called hurdy gurdy because it sounds like hurdy burdy, which means like an awful racket. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a kind of marmite instrument. You either love it or hate it. Uh, I love it, um, but I'll just show you how it works. Uh, this is a hurdy gurdy, and um, it's there's made up of various strings. Uh, these are the melody strings, and oh, if I put the melody strings down, add a bit of drone to it, it gets, it's kind of like a deep bass sound. Percussion bit, I call it the trumpet. So, Thanks so much to Elliot for sharing with us and to Anne for recording that. Next up, we have Joanna Ezekiel, who is here with us live, and she's going to share with us some poetry to tell us a bit about her story. Joanna is a creative writing tutor at the Open University and has a published novel as well as two poetry collections. So we're going to hand over now to Joanna. Thank you very much, and I really am delighted to be 
start of this launch tonight. I think my, the section should be called Heritage Detectives, the later years, because unlike the key stage two pupils at whom the book is aimed, I became a heritage, a heritage detective in my 40s. My father, Danny, was from the B'nai Israel Jewish community in India, and he pronounced it B'nai Israel, but it is also pronounced B'nai Israel. And he would have been 87 years old yesterday, and he died on this week eight years ago. So this is a very timely um, reading, I think. In, in 2011, I was lucky enough to go on a Jewish Renaissance magazine cultural tour to India for three weeks. Uh, that was a fantastic experience. My, our first stop was in my father's home city of Mumbai, where he had lived until the age of 30 before coming to the UK for postgraduate study and remaining here for the rest of his life. Before I went to India, he told me to keep an open mind about what I would experience. I found that everywhere I went in Mumbai, I had a strong sense of my father's roots and I took lots of photos of his university, his favorite beach and his old synagogue to show him on my return. This was 2011, remember, it wasn't, um, couldn't send instant photos as easily in those days. So there was a strong sense of familiarity along with the expected culture shock, but I wasn't prepared for the sense of loss that I felt that as well in that first week. A few days into the tour, our guide Ralphie Jurad took us to Alibag, which is an area southwest of Mumbai. This is the birthplace of the Bene Israel community. They were shipwrecked here around 175 BC while fleeing from Roman persecution. And there was a very old story that during a storm, Elijah and he, the prophet Elijah and his horses landed. And the next morning, the Jewish and Hindu communities saw hoof marks in the dust in this coastal area of Alibag. And this had such an impact on both communities that they both still pray to Elijah today. We also visited the beautiful synagogue, which was run by a Bene Israeli family. They're very hardworking. I was asked to write an article for Jewish Renaissance magazine. And what I did, I focused on jotting down lots of sensory details of the surroundings, so details of sight, sounds, touch, texture, um, and yeah, lots of, lots of sensory details. And I also recorded various, jotted down various words and phrases that people were using that I hadn't heard before. And also the way that people were um, describing things in order to give the historical information a sense of place. And I also wanted to link past and present together with lots of detail. And here we can see uh, the sign saying hoofmark of Elihu Hanabi's horses. That's what the prophet Elijah was called in that area and the beautiful synagogue. Um, my dad and the photo was taken after I got back from India. And since our visit, Ralphi Jirad has set up a heritage museum in Alibag and he has, he's a real dynamo. He's organized many cultural tours to the area. Although of course these are on hold due to the pandemic. So you never know, the heritage detectives of today could inspire the heritage decisions of the future. I didn't know when I went, visited Alibag that there would now be a heritage museum and a website dedicated to cultural tours. That's very exciting. I'm now going to read two poems that I wrote in India about my experiences. So they, they started and the first one finished in, in India. The second one I developed more when I came back. Um, and I think they combine my observations, all the sensory details, with the mix of emotions that I felt during this part of the visit to India. And this is reflected in the very fragmented format of the poems. Now, the first one published in Jewish Renaissance is called Alibag. Schoolgirls cycle past us, red ribbon plaits, wire baskets, one rattling a jacaranda branch. My dad is Indian and Jewish, I tell people all my life, without them even asking. Perhaps I am a lost echo of this country. Ghosts of the past, sewn into curtains or beaded on mezuzahs. All temples carry loss for what is broken. Later I see it, jacaranda branch discarded on the road. Nobody else need know. Faith, a red ribbon tied around my bones. This is why I am here, weighing up the toll on this dusty road. The next poem um, 
I wrote because we stayed in the same hotel in Mumbai in the business district for quite, for quite a few days. We then we later went to Kerala and then to coaching and then we, we, um, we learned more about the Jewish community there and then we returned to Mumbai. Mumbai morning and you can see I've put up a few photos of Mumbai, um, my dad's university, the synagogue where his parents were married and the gateway of India which we all visited and the schoolgirls there as well. <laughs> Very neat. Mumbai morning. My, this first morning, I rise early. My long crush to absorb it all sees me floating at the hotel window high above the pavement. The beach, an Indian flag, a man falls in his fishing line. Ships, old, moored in the distance, remind me of my ancestors. Once castaways along this shore, like lost biblical passages, a Jewish thread that has me flying over the Arabian Sea. Could be coriander growing in planters by the red R2D2 post box, and worn out by hard labour, a man lies on his thin mat, sleeps through sunshine that vies with the yellow roofs of cars. This first morning, I, running on a western track, Keep an open mind beyond falling in love from the hotel floor. Thank you very much and good luck with Heritage Detectives. Thank you very much, Joanna. <laughs> that was really amazing. Now we're going to hear from our keynote speaker this evening, Sandra Teacher. Sandra is a highly experienced and qualified educational consultant and has been carrying out offset inspections for over 20 years. Amongst other things, Sandra works at the Department for Education to produce Religious Studies GCSE material and is a trustee of the Religious Education Council. And she's agreed to speak with us now. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for giving me the privilege to speak with all of you. Whenever I meet people, I always say, my name is Sandra, Sandra Teacher, and the most important thing that I want you to know about me is that I am a teacher. Uh, over and above everything else that I do. And speaking tonight, I particularly want to speak to all the teaching audience, uh, to all the teachers out there who are going to use this wonderful resource. And I'd just like to start by sharing with you, by lighting up just a little candle. And those of you who are Jewish will recognize that this is a Havdalah candle, a plaited candle, because I feel it's a wonderful way of showing this resource, how it's going to be the light of the future, for some from form of education. And using this light, using the plaited candle, the theme that I want to talk to you about is integration. So thinking about the resource, why is it such an important resource for schools today? Although it's been labeled under the uh, subject heading of history, what I want teachers to be thinking about is actually integrating it and using it throughout their curriculum. So we've had wonderful examples tonight of music, of poetry, and, but there's no reason why being a heritage detective can't, for example, come through geography, of course, because we've had masses of geography as well this evening, and art design technology, all the subjects of the curriculum. I'd like teachers to think about using this resource in a whole range of ways uh, as the theme, if you like, and the topic that they're following for all their subjects. What I'd also like them to think about, and those of you in education will, will understand what I mean. One of the things that the government wants um, schools to do is to follow what we would call fundamental British values. And one of the their most important fundamental British values is to have respect and tolerance for other faiths and cultures. And so using this resource, again, it will be promoting fundamental British values. The other really important area that I want to talk about is what we call spiritual, moral, social and cultural development. It's at the heart of education and an important part of everything that schools do today. It's the ethos of the school and I often call it the sort of the DNA that runs through a school. And if you think about spiritual, moral, social and cultural development, using this resource, one would be able to cover all the different areas. And I'll give you some sort of example. So let's look at spiritual development. Spiritual development, if you like in, let's say, Ofsted or inspector terms, it means raising confidence and self-esteem, helping young people to reach their potential. By using this resource, by finding out 
where they belong, what kind of culture they come from, about their families, of course that's going to raise their confidence and self-esteem and give them that confidence to go forward in the world. Moral development, thinking about um, standards, the way to behave, thinking about the way their families, the way that they came from. It was very touching, all the stories that you told, particularly about difficult circumstances, how their families went through difficult circumstances, but they came through with a positive outlook. Thinking about moral dilemmas and using the resource in that way. Social development, how to get on with your neighbors, how to have respect for others. And by finding out about the different cultures in the schools where we work, certainly throughout England, we have an enormous range of cultures. And I know all the different areas um, where the resource has investigated will have young people from many, many different faith groups and none, uh, worldviews as we call it today, and of course different cultures. So uh, socializing with them, finding out about them, doing that research, that's social development. And lastly we have, not the most important one, but the one that's equally important, and that's cultural development. And schools have a duty to promote that. All schools and, and governors have a duty and responsibility to make sure that the schools do. And cultural development is really divided into two main ways. The first and most important thing that we want young people to know is about their own culture. Because if you don't know who you are, if you don't know who you belong to, you actually don't know where you're going. And so to know and learn about your own culture, that has to be the most important thing to give you a sense of identity. And once you feel strong in your own culture and understand your own identity and who you belong to, then you can start to learn about other people and respect and know about them. So I hope that's just given you a little bit of perspective, a little bit of insight into how this wonderful resource can be used in a whole range of ways. And I hope the teachers will think about that and, and possibly come and you know, I'm always there to help and to ask about how they can use it to really widen the perspective of the curriculum and make the curriculum integrated, meaningful and broad and balanced. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sandra. That was a brilliant uh, talk. And thank you for your kind words about heritage detectives. Um, so we're coming to the final part of our evening now where Ed is going to uh, just show us very quick a whistle stop tour of the heritage detectives book. So over to you, Ed. So there's our cover. And um, as I referred to right at the beginning, um, we have two children who take our pupils on this journey. Um, Sam and Sarah, and uh, we think they're really lovable characters. Here's the four sections that uh, you're taking on through the book, natural heritage, community heritage, family heritage, and diverse heritage. There are exercises, there are things to do, there are things to read, there are things to think about. And of course, they're backed up with resources on the website to extend some of these ex exercises further. And um, it's aimed primarily at around age nine, but with the teacher's help, it can go back all the way back to age six. And you'll see the little uh, hexagon uh, marker on some of the pages and those will take you to some of the videos which you'll find on our website and there is the website address that easily found on there. You can see throughout the book um, we have the word bank where pupils are asked, children are asked about the meaning and to think about the words that we are using. We're talking about finding photos. Um, and here's an example, find an old photo of your family or a historical photo, maybe a photo from before you were born or perhaps even before your parents were born. I know that I spent the whole of my younger years looking through suitcases and suitcases of photographs. And we refer to some of the locations that we have in our larger projects, connecting small histories. So here's a photo of Eastbourne and a little bit of history about Eastbourne. A little bit of mind mapping.
And here's one of the small communities. This one is in Bradford. This is actually the Reform Synagogue, which is very decorative. And here we have an art project and you can download the file for the art project so you can print out the letters and use that as your art project. So there's a resource for teachers to download and for students to use. And that's a short run through of our book, of our, The Heritage Detectives. Marvellous. Thank you, Ed. And thank you everyone for coming this evening. And thank you to anyone that's watching this retrospectively on our Heritage Hub as well. So a figurative cheers to the book. If you have a glass of water or juice or even a champagne or a cocktail, then I suggest that you raise it to the Heritage Detectives and everybody who's made the book and this evening possible. Thank you again from all of us here.